grateful for Nanette and the awesome foundation that she has laid and then looking forward as we move forward to what God has in store for us. But Stacy, thank you so much for the summer and as you saw, lots of fun uh, science things, um, learning about God in the mix. And we just so appreciate you um, and your gifting and willingness to, to uh, live and learn with the kids this summer. So thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> And then Nanette and Bob headed out yesterday for a big trip overseas, including Estonia and some other countries. And so, um, so they're on their way there. But when you see Nanette, make sure to give her a big, uh, big thank you as well for all of those years of serving. And just, um, and we all know Nanette, right? And how amazing uh, she is and the things that she's been able to do with the kids. And so we're thankful for that legacy. Um, but she will continue in, in education. She wants to spend more time with the grandkids, but she isn't retired. She's just cutting back her hours a little bit, so make sure to say thank you to her when you see her. And then Christina, we're excited to have her here too, and she's been downstairs with Stacy for a couple weeks getting to know the kids and some of the families. And so uh, now that you've seen her face as you see her around, make sure to give her a warm welcome as well. So we're talking about how God is faithful, and so we know even in these big transitions that God is faithful. Uh, we know that he will continue to be here with us and that he'll continue working and that he's going to be working in the hearts of, of our children's ministry as well. And so uh, actually pretty exciting to see what he'll do with that. But today we're going to continue our series on Not Afraid, Moving from Fear to Faith. And I think many of you know um, a little bit about us as a family, that one of the things that we love to do is to be in the mountains. And we love to hike, and we love to camp, and probably our most favorite thing, I would say, would be backpacking um, whenever we're able to get the opportunity to do that. And Steve and Joshua uh, went a couple weeks ago, I guess, right, and have a, have a cool one coming up in the sand dunes um, in September, too. So uh, some pretty awesome things. And so uh, I didn't give Steve a warning I was going to talk about him this morning. <laughs> But we kind of tease him because, as you may know, I'm a planner, right? So when we hike, I like a trail, I like a map, I like to know our destination. If you remember, Steve's kind of an adventurer, and so he likes to just kind of go with it. And so he likes to take shortcuts, <laughs> which we tease him, often turn into long cuts. <laughs> because sometimes when you take a shortcut, it isn't shorter, is it? And you know, right, I'm about five feet tall, give me five foot, okay? <laughs> and when you're trying to climb over down trees and things, when you're not on the trail, it can be pretty messy. Um, but it, he's so fun, uh, and we love that he leads us in crazy places, and we usually end up where we need to be, right? So, uh, but those shortcuts uh, sometimes can be messy. And so today we're looking at a story. We're going to start with Abram and Sarai because that's kind of, uh, we need that background to get to where we're going today. And this story comes out of their shortcut, which becomes a long cut and ends up to be very messy. And so uh, you... Uh, uh, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to backtrack a little bit, we're going to look at the big story, and we're going to talk about don't take the shortcut. Nothing is impossible with God. Don't take that shortcut. Nothing is impossible with God. And so let's turn to Genesis 15, just to get a little bit of the history here real quick. This might be a story that you're pretty familiar with, uh, but in Genesis 15, we have God with Abram. And you notice at verse 4 there on page 21, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Abram, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And so God has made this promise to Abram and to Sarai that, they, uh, that this great nation would come from them, that their descendants would, would be as numerous as the stars. Okay, so then we're going to fast forward a little bit um, to Genesis 16. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with a minister named Philip Brooks, also a writer, he lived in the 1800s. Uh, he was really known for his poise and his very quiet manner. So one day a friend came in and he was just pacing. He said he looks like a caged lion. He just was pacing, so he knew something was going on. So he asked him what the trouble was. And so he replied, the trouble is that I am in a hurry 
and God is not. <laughs> and maybe you have felt that way sometimes too, where you're waiting and waiting on God, uh, and it seems like he just isn't in a hurry. And so I kind of think that's what's going on here as we come to chapter 16 um, with Sarai. And so if you look at the beginning of the chapter there on page 22, chapter 16, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him how many children? None, no children. But she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Do you think she's gotten a little bit impatient here? Uh, I, I sent some doubt or some fear in there, right, about whether God is going to do what he said he was going to do. So then it says, Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. And so God had promised this great promise to Abram and Sarai. Uh, and as time goes on, I think Sarai's really wondering if God is going to do that. And so she takes things into her own hand and this shortcut becomes a long cut because it's about to get really messy here. You notice that at the beginning of chapter 16 here, um, that it, it, Sarai doesn't go to God and ask if she should do this, that God doesn't come to her and tell her to do this, that she seems to be looking at this from a human perspective and thinking, I am way past childbearing age, so I, I better figure out a way to make this happen. Uh, God is the God of the impossible. We don't need to take those shortcuts because God can do what through our human eyes seems impossible. So we'll see a little bit later on to how God is faithful to his promise. Uh, and eventually Sarai uh, becomes pregnant and bears a son as well. And so we'll get there in the story. Uh, but from this part, what we learn is don't take the shortcut. God is a God who can do the impossible. This movie called The Princess Diaries might be a little out of your genre, maybe. <laughs> might not be one you choose, but we've got teenage girls at home. Um, and so this is a story, Anne Hathaway is a teenager. The movie opens on sort of a regular day at the high school. Um, and out front, we've got the popular boys and girls flirting together. Uh, and Mia, Anne Hathaway, shows up uh, just feeling lost and unimportant and unseen, like she usually does. She's standing next to her friend Lily, and a teacher walks by. And so Mia greets her, and she says, good morning, Miss Gupta. And Miss Gupta looks at her and can't remember her name. And so she actually then addresses Lily and says, hi, Lily and Lily's friend. Oh, there's kind of that awkward pause there. And then in the next scene, Mia has books, and she's kind of walking through this crowd, and she sits down on this low wall. Uh, and then there's this uh, guy, student, walking along, and, and he's uh, talking with someone else. And he comes over, and he actually accidentally sits on her. And so he quickly apologizes, but that damage is already done. And Mia turns to Lily and says, somebody sat on me again. Oh, have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you're not seen? Have you ever felt like you're invisible, that you're unimportant, that you've been sat upon? I imagine the person that we are going to concentrate on today felt something like that. You notice in the story, Abram and Sarai don't actually use her name. They, they call her the maidservant or the Egyptian even. And so let's look at Genesis 16. Let's continue from where we were uh, at verse 4 here. So this is Hagar, and she's pregnant. And then it says, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. Any of you men relate to that? <laughs> all right, Abram, it's all your fault. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, and so she fled from her. Like, it was so bad that Hagar actually runs away to the desert. 
So then as we continue the story, the angel of the Lord found Hagar sitting near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael. Look down to the footnotes down there. Ishmael means what? God hears. So God is telling her, I hear you. Your son will be named Ishmael. And then verse 13, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. In verse 15, so Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. We can try to run away, but God will meet us right where we are, and he will meet our deepest need. And so we hear from Hagar, she names God. You are the one who sees me. If you were to name God, what would you name him? You are the God who loves me. You are the God who comforts me. You are the God who protects me. Whatever we choose would say a lot about us, wouldn't it? As well as who God is. And so it's possible Hagar didn't even really know that was her need. And yet when God meets her, she knows that he sees her. And she may seem like an insignificant person. It's possible that you know the story of Abram and Sarai and becoming Abraham and Sarah. Um, But Hagar isn't a place we usually spend very much time. Um, And so it's possible that she's been overlooked by many of us even. But she could have chosen any name and, and, and uh, she might seem like she's insignificant, but that's one of the longest conversations that, uh, that almost even any man has in the Old Testament with God. Uh, and, and she's the only one who names God. God usually tells us his name, doesn't he? Right? El Shaddai, the Almighty. And she chooses a name that's a very personal, intimate name, that you are the God who sees me. Nicole Johnson has this article called I Am Invisible, and I just want to read part of it to you. I want to think of, uh, she's a mom, so she's coming from a mom perspective, but I want you to think about this in your context and what this might look like for you. Some days I am only a pair of hands, nothing more. Can you fix this? Can you tie this? Can you open this? Some days I'm not a pair of hands. I'm not even a human being. I'm a clock to ask, what time is it? I'm a satellite guide to answer, what number is the Disney Channel? I'm a car to order, right around 5.30, please. I was certain that these were the hands that once held books and the eyes that studied history and the mind that graduated, but now they had all disappeared into the peanut butter, never to be seen again. She's going, she's going, she's gone. Have you ever felt that uh, you're unseen, that you're invisible, that people are just looking for what they can take from you, but they don't see you as a person. Well, we know that God sees you. And Psalm 139 is awesome, where it says, before I formed you, I saw you. Before you were even formed, God says, I saw you. And Matthew 6 talks about when you pray, go into a room, close the door, and pray in secret. And you know what? He sees you there. And so I think we all have this fundamental need to be seen, don't we? That's why those little kids are like, watch me, watch me, watch me. We have a friend, Jessie has a friend that she swam with on a summer swim team. And summer swim team, have you ever been to one of those meets? It is crazy. Uh, And it takes a lot of volunteers to make those run. And so as parents, we're required to do so many shifts every summer. So this... Uh, friends, parents would always take either the Friday night setup shift or the Saturday cleanup shift after the meet. And their daughter swam, but they were never there to watch her. Not a single race, not a single meet. And she started acting out a little bit. And I think what she was doing was saying, watch me, watch me. 
And how many of us, even as adults, are like, watch me. We still want to be seen, don't we? And so Hagar meets God in the desert, and she says, you are the one who sees me. He sees you, and he knows you. And we can try to run, but God is there. I love that story about the map, one of the maps that's on display in the British Museum in London. It's a mariner's chart from like the 1500s. Uh, and the cartographer had uh, laid it out. There were still some uncharted waters in there. Uh, and so in one place he wrote, here be fiery scorpions. And in another place he wrote, here be dragons. And eventually this map ended up in the hands of Sir John Franklin, who was a British explorer in the 1800s. And, and so he takes that map out and he scribbles out all those fearful inscriptions. And across the whole map, even those uncharted waters, he writes, God is here. We're going to sing Not Afraid in a little bit. It talks about um, the valley and the shadow, and it doesn't matter if it's the desert or the valley or the shadow, that God is there, that we can try to run, but God is still there, and he sees you. He knows you. Here is God. And so as our story continues, let's turn uh, to chapter 21. I believe it's on page 29. And we see here God's faithfulness as the story continues. Because we see at the very beginning, verse 1, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. There's an emphasis there, isn't it? It doesn't just say, so God gave him a son. It says, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had what? promised. Sarah tried to take a shortcut to get there, and it ended up to be a long, messy cut. But here we see God's faithfulness as he does what he says he is going to do. And so we see that Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave him the name Isaac, to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, he circumcised him as God commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And so we see God's faithfulness coming to fruition here and him showing himself once again faithful. Uh, and then the story continues here as we go down a little farther. Because then there's trouble again between Sarah and Hagar. And so verse 8 and 9, Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for he will never share the inheritance of my son Isaac. Uh, and so Abraham was distressed, but God said to him, verse 13, I will make the son of your maidservant into a nation also, because he is your offspring. And then look what happens, verse 14. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar, set them on her shoulders and set her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. So here we find Hagar back in the desert. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. So they're, they're thirsty, aren't they? And as she sat nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Oh, oh, what are those next words? Do not be afraid. Say those loud. Do not be afraid. Here we go. This is our sermon theme, right, for this series. Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. So how much water is in the desert? Not much, right? Okay. Don't take a shortcut because God is able to do what? The impossible. So here we go, verse 19. Then God opened her eyes and she saw what? A well of water in the desert. This is a God who is able to do the impossible, a God who is faithful. And so she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. 
And so over and over again, the underlying theme of all these sermons is God's faithfulness, that God is faithful, that we don't need to take a shortcut because God can do the impossible. He's a God who sees you. She's in the desert. God sees her, and, she's, and he sees Ishmael, and he takes care of them. And so God does what is promised. God is a God who sees you. Now, I think then, too, one of the awesome things about God is he allows us to see him. And so let's talk as we wrap up about seeing the God who sees you. Because if we look back real quick in, in chapter 16 with the angel, um, where she names God in verse 13, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me that God allows us to see him too. We ask for him to give us eyes to see him, that he is at work around us all the time. God is here, and he's at work around us all the time. And so we need eyes to see, hearts that are open to seeing him at work, to look for him and what he's doing. And then in that, he invites us to see those that he sees that sometimes we miss those invisible people, those unseen in our culture. It was really cool this week, spent a day down at the NALC convention. Ed Brustel is here, awesome job this week, getting us all lined up and um, lots of volunteers and several of you were down there helping as well. Um, just a great week and got to spend time with a friend of mine who's in ministry um, and he works uh, uh, making a voice for those who are unseen in the womb of their moms, uh, is partnering together with another ministry who works with a lot of the unseen, um, like especially those with disabilities. But think about your week, and who is it in your week that you walk by without seeing? Who is it in our society, and our culture that are unseen? Like Hagar, don't even, we don't even name them. We just call them by whatever stereotype we have of them. Who is that for you? I was trying to finish up, it was kind of a crazy week, so here's Confessions of a Pastor, trying to finish up my sermon yesterday morning. <laughs> and I had been ruminating things, but I'm like, where's the story for the unseen? Where is the story? And my phone rang, and it's a number that I didn't recognize, so usually I don't answer those. But Dan's at his high school reunion this week, and so I wanted to make sure that if someone needed something, that I was available. So I answered it. Immediately, as soon as he spoke, I knew who it was. Pastor Amy! He's like, how are you and the big man? And I'm like, caveman. So this is a homeless guy who we worked with at the last congregation that we served at. Uh, he and several guys would uh, get on a bus, which is not easy to do on a Sunday morning, and come worship with us. We helped him out in a lot of ways, but what we came to discover was that they really just wanted, wanted us to know their name and wanted to sit and have time with us to talk and to share their stories. And so we did that. Almost every week we would sit down and have him, um, and he will just call in and check in with me. Pastor Amy, how's the big man? And he just wants me to know that he's okay and to touch base and to keep that relationship going. But I tell you what, if he were standing on the corner of 287, I would have driven right by him. I wouldn't have seen him. How many of those folks do we go by during the week that we don't see them? Can we this week pray and ask God to give us eyes to see them, to lift our heads up out of our business, whatever that is, um, and to pay attention to who's around us as we're just going through life? We see in Hagar this move from fear to faith as God shows his faithfulness. We don't need to take shortcuts because God is able to do the impossible, that he sees you, and that he allows you to see him as well. And then he invites us to see all of those that he sees. Maybe some of you have seen the movie Toy Story. Have you seen that movie? With Woody, who's, who's a toy cowboy, and Buzz Lightyear, who's an astronaut, toy astronaut. And near the beginning of the movie, Woody shouts um, to Buzz, you're not a space ranger, you're an action figure, a kid's plaything. And after he fails to fly, Buzz realizes the truth of that. And so he kind of hangs his head in resignation, and he's like, I'm just a stupid little insignificant toy. 
But then later in the movie, we see Woody trying to comfort his friend, and he says, you must not be thinking clearly. Look over in that house. There's a kid who thinks you are the greatest, and it's not because you're a space ranger. It's because you're his. And so Buzz kind of looks at his foot. He lifts his foot. He sees a label on the bottom. In permanent ink is written the name of this boy to whom he belongs. And Buzz kind of perks up. He has new determination uh, and, and, and is just filled. You are God's. His name is on you. He sees you. He knows you. He invites you to come with him to see him and to reach out to those who he sees and we often miss because his name is on them too. So can we come alongside folks, uh, just like what Woody did with Buzz Lightyear, to tell them God's name is on you, that he loves you, that he's a God who sees you. And may you know that this week, don't take the shortcuts. God is able to do the impossible and he sees you, he knows you, He'll show himself to you and then move from that fear to faith and step out, looking around and paying attention to those unseen folks who we might miss but God sees and whose name is on them too. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning for the reminders of your faithfulness, that even though fear creeps in with us, uh, that you are a God who is faithful, a God who continues to pursue us with your love, with your mercy, with your grace, that there's nowhere that we can run to that you are not there. And so I pray this week that you would continue to remind us of that, um, help us to step from fear into faith, uh, like Hagar does as she listens to the angel, uh, as she believes that you will do what you said you were going to do. Um, I pray that you would work through us, that you would remind us that you see us, Help us to look for you and see you as well. And then give us eyes to see those folks who often get passed by, who are unseen, invisible, unnamed, to tell them that they are named, that you have called them chosen and redeemed and loved and forgiven. And so just uh, work through us this week. Use us as your servants. May your light shine. Uh, and may others be drawn into your kingdom through your story. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.